So my name is Lisa Pearl. This is me right here. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Language Science and, of Co and in Cognitive Sciences at the University of California, Irvine. And I run the Computation of Language Laboratory. And this is a presentation for uh, UC Irvine's Family Weekend. And what I want to talk to you today is about language and why babies, and sometimes adults are awesome, and I'm going to be covering in this part babies. So, okay. It's so natural for us to produce and comprehend language that we often don't think about what an accomplishment this is until, for example, we try as adults to learn another language and then we realize, wow, that's really hard to beat a native speaker uh, of a language, right? But so the incredible thing, of course, is that we all learned how to be native speakers of our native languages, right? So how we learned language in the first place is language development, which is what I study. And it's, it's really fascinating. So one of the things you might ask is, you know, what's all the fuss about language development? And the, the big thing is that it turns out that babies are amazing at learning language. So in particular, this uh, dinosaurs comic, I think really highlights some of the, the excitement and the, the coolness of what's going on here. So I'll read certain, certain parts of this to you. We have dinosaur number one here. Adults think other adults are the best. Teens know teens are the coolest. And, you know, kids posit that kids rule while parents in comparison drool. But you know who's really the coolest? Dang old babies. You can take a baby, put it down in a room full of complete strangers making crazy noises. And that baby will do the following. Presuppose those noises have meaning. Independently invent the very idea of language and then learn to communicate in that language. They will stone cold deduce rules of language from observation alone. And they'll do it way faster than an adult ever could. And Dinosaur 2 says, but babies are stupid. They crawl off cliffs if given half a chance. Absolutely, says Dinosaur 1. Our offspring are idiot savants, right? They do all of this stuff without even having a language to think in, right? So that's, that's really kind of the essence of it, is this incredible thing that babies are able to accomplish, that we all accomplished in our native language. And so what I want to ask right now is, and what you might be wondering is, OK, what exactly do you know when you know language? And the answer is a lot, actually. So I'm going to show you some of the things that you know how to do in your native language or languages. So you know how to identify words influence speech using the process of speech segmentation. So what do I mean by that? So let's take this phrase, what a pretty kitty. What I just said is actually acoustically, if you look at the, the actual physical signal out there in the world that was hitting your eardrums, it's this kind of messy thing, right? But you don't perceive it as a messy continuous thing, right? You perceive it as these discrete units, what a pretty kitty. But there is actually no space in between the words. This white space is an illusion that we use when we write. If I actually said this out loud with spaces in it, it would sound weird. What a pretty kitty. That's not how we talk. We talk as this continuous stream of sound, and the process of speech segmentation is breaking up that speech, that messy speech signal, into some sort of internal representation that's more discreet or symbolic so that we consciously interpret the messy signal as a recognizable stream of words. We segment it into recognizable pieces like what a pretty kitty. And you know how to do that in all of your native languages. And you also know how to pronounce words using your knowledge of the phonology of your language. So in English, this little guy might be called a kitty with stress or emphasis on that first syllable ki. And if you mess the stress up, it doesn't sound right anymore. You can't call the same little guy a kitty. That's not right. It's kitty, not kitty. Your knowledge about that is your knowledge of phonology. You also know that certain words behave like other words. What do I mean by that? Let, well, let's look at this, uh, this utterance from before. What a pretty blank. Now, we used kitty before. But we could also say, what a pretty penguin, what a pretty owl. Penguin and kitty and owl behave the same. They can all fit there. And we know that as speakers of English. We know that they all behave the same. And why do we know that? Because we've clumped them together into a, an abstract category that we use when we're putting words together using our knowledge of syntax. So we make syntactic categories in our languages. And for example, in English, penguin and kitty and owl, and owl are the syntactic category of noun, right? So you know how to do that for all of the native languages that you speak. Now, 
Let's consider this. So, oh look, a pretty kitty. Look, there's another one. Well, another what? Well, we have to interpret this word one in context, in this case, using sort of that visual context and importantly, the linguistic context of what preceded it. Oh, look, a pretty kitty. Oh, look, a, there's another one, another what? And as a, a native speaker of English or a fluent speaker of English, you might have the intuition that there's another pretty kitty or maybe maybe that there's just another kitty who is not so pretty but importantly you did not have the intuition that this meant look there's another wombat and there are any number of reasons why but it mostly has to do with your knowledge of syntax and semantics together so syntax is again about how, how putting words together to make larger conceptual units so for example questions right so let's consider this scenario this kitty was bought as a present for someone okay we don't know who but someone Lily thinks this kitty is pretty. So can we ask about the situation this way? Who does Lily think the kitty for is pretty? I'll say it again. Who does Lily think the kitty for is pretty? And the answer is you really can't ask it the way. You're hopefully making this kind of face, which is what I'm making when I try to say it out loud. It's really hard to say because it's an ill-formed question. It doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, my internal rules of syntax of English tell me it doesn't work, but it's uh, hard to say what they are out loud, but I know that this does not work. That's something that I know using my knowledge of syntax. You also know how to identify the right interpretation in context using your knowledge of pragmatics, which is how we use language to communicate. What are the goals and intentions of speakers and listeners? And so let's consider this kitty right here. And also there are a couple more kitties. Here are some guys on stairs. Here's a guy in a, in a little wine glass, very cute, right? And so suppose given this scenario, I say to you, hey, look, every kitty didn't sit on the stairs. What does that mean? How do you interpret that? Well, it turns out this is actually ambiguous. It technically could mean one of two things. One, no kitty sat on the stairs or not all the kitties sat on the stairs. Both of them are actually legitimate interpretations of every kitty didn't sit on the stairs. But in this scenario, how do you interpret it? Well, most adults will interpret it as this one, not all the kitties sat on the stairs. When I say every kitty didn't sit on the stairs, you interpret this to mean not all the kitties sat on the stairs. Why? Well, the answer is something like this. You think about why I as a speaker would have said that. What was I trying to inform you about? And given this scenario, which of these might have been true or can be true? So I have to think about what they mean and I have to think about, oh, if I say no kitty sat on the stairs, well, that's not true because these guys are on stairs. If I meant not all the kitties sat on the stairs, that's okay because now I'm talking about these and that's a true statement for this scenario, right? That whole reasoning process of language for communication, language in the context of speakers and listeners is pragmatics, right? Finding the right interpretation and context, that's also something you know how to do. And so all of these things and more, right? This is what you know when you know a language, right? So how exactly do children learn all of this? That's the question. We know they do it relatively quickly. In fact, most of this stuff is something uh, that children have figured out by the age of four, this entirety of this linguistic system. I mean, some of it still develops a little bit afterwards, but a lot of it is by age four, which is really young in life. If you think about all the things that you will master in your life, mastering this by age four is really quick right and the interesting thing and this is something that the dinosaurs comic mentioned is they mostly do this without explicit instruction without someone sitting down and explaining to them all the rules about how everything works and having them practice it with these rules that is not how it goes when you're learning your native language right and even when you do try to explicitly instruct kids most of the time i can think about you know younger than age four they're not really paying attention to it especially if it doesn't impact their meaning, if it doesn't prevent them from being understood. And I have this really nice anecdote uh, that demonstrates an example of this. The child says, uh, want other one spoon, daddy, right? Which is not the way we would express this thought as adults. And her father recognizes that and says, oh, you mean you want the other spoon? Yes, I want other one spoon, please, daddy. Right, like she completely ignores his, his changing of the form. Can you say the other spoon? This is the explicit instruction. And the child is completely baffled by this. She's like, other one spoon. Say other. Other. Spoon. Spoon. Other spoon. Other spoon. Now give me other one spoon. 
right? Like, so she got the explicit instruction. She ignored it because it didn't impact her ability to be understood. It was clear from the very beginning of this interaction. Her dad understood exactly what she meant, right? But the form of what she was saying, that just didn't kind of sink in, despite her father laboriously trying to instruct her explicitly in that form. So what's another way that kids might be learning what they learn? And what you might think reasonably is they imitate a lot. And the problem with this idea that kids are imitating is that imitation's not gonna get them that far. It's certainly useful for learning some aspects of language, for learning, for example, that a sequence of sounds in English cat refers to a furry purring pet like this guy, right? But it doesn't get you a lot further, right? You can't, for example, learn how to understand and produce full sentences in the language by imitating what you hear and repeat, and then just repeating it word for word. And there are a couple of reasons why that doesn't work. One, most of the sentences you actually hear are novel. You understand and produce them on the fly. You may never have heard them before, and yet still you understand them. So if you can understand something that you never heard before, for example, the sentence that I'm just saying right this very moment, if you've never heard this exact sentence before in your life, and you can still understand it, it means that you must be doing something else than just imitating and, and you know, figuring it out just by having heard it before, right? That's not what you're doing. That's not what kids are doing, right? Moreover, it turns out that children are bad at imitating sentences where they don't know some of the words, right? So if you're saying, oh, they're learning these words by imitating them in the sentences they hear, it doesn't work that way. And here's a, this is a sort of very stark example. You have these things called imitation tasks where you literally have the child try to imitate, to say word for word what you are saying. So you sit the child down, you say, okay, you're gonna say exactly what I'm saying. And the child's like, yes, I understand, right? So you establish that that is what you're doing and you say, okay, repeat after me. The cat is hungry and the, and the child looks at you and says cat hungry and you're like no 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 repeat after me the cat is hungry and she looks at you and she says cat hungry right like she's not getting the the and the is if she doesn't already know them right so how could she learn them in the first place by just repeating it's not it's not what's going on with these kids in addition just in general children don't often repeat word for word what adults around them are saying Right? In fact, nobody does. Right? Try to do what I'm doing right now. Try to repeat word for word what I just said a minute ago. It's really hard. Right? You can't do that even as an adult. And children definitely are not doing that except in very rare occasions. Right? So you're not repeating word for word entire sentences. That's just not how humans work. So okay, you're not doing any of that. What are you doing? Well, what we think kids are doing is extracting patterns, making generalizations about the rules that are underlying their language, just by hearing examples of what's allowed in the language, just by hearing people talk to them in that language. Children are able to unconsciously or subconsciously, however you want to think about this, not explicitly, not like they're sitting there trying to do this, but they are unconsciously or subconsciously extracting patterns abstracting things, making generalizations on the basis of those abstractions. They're doing that all the time. And so the rules that they're extracting, what are they? Well, again, if you think about, well, if there are rules, then are they explicitly being taught? And the answer is probably not, because once we go beyond the most superficial things, like the fact that cat in English refers to a furry purring pet, so someone says cat, you say, ah, that's just a cat, we call it a cat, except for that. Most of our knowledge about language, especially the forms that language takes, is subconscious. We know it, we can recognize when something is acceptable in our language, when something is not acceptable. But we don't know how we know it. And we often are really struggling to explain why it's so other than you simply, you can say this and you can't say that. It's really hard to get at the rule. That's what linguists actually study is what the rules actually are. But this is not something your average speaker is aware of, right? Most of our knowledge about the rules of our language is subconscious. So let me give you a quick demonstration of this. So examples from English. So for example, if I say to you, oh, here's my new thing, it's a strimp, I really like it. Well, if you never heard the word strimp before, you might say, well, I don't know what that is, but it's a possible word, word of English. I, I get it, That's, that could be an English word, great. And if, compare that to what if I say to you, oh, it's my new stvimp. And you have the sense, if you're an English speaker, that that is not an English word. Why? Why is strimp an English word 
and stvimp is English is not an English word. You haven't heard either either of them before. And what you can probably pinpoint it to is that well, the strimp str sounds okay, and stv doesn't sound okay, and why not? Right? Like you have this internalized knowledge of the Englishy forms, right? Of how things are pronounced, what makes good sounding words, good Englishy sounding words versus not Englishy sounding words. That's something you've picked up as a speaker of English. Here's one about uh, word forms, right? So in English, we have contracted forms like wanna, which is short for want to, and gonna, which is short for going to. And it turns out that we are very aware of when wanna and gonna can replace their respective full forms and when they can't. So let's consider this. We have a collection of Disney princesses and you get to choose who you will rescue. So someone says to you, hey, who do you want to rescue? That's the full form. But they might also say to you, who do you want to rescue? Where you've got the contracted form, and that's both of these are perfectly fine. But what about this? Suppose you get to choose who will do the rescuing. We have Disney Prince A or Disney Prince B, and so someone says to you, okay, who do you want to do the rescuing? Full form, okay, but can you contract there? Hey, who do you want to do the rescuing? And something doesn't sound right. You're like, I don't, I don't really like that contraction there, right? And it's even more stark with going to to Ghana. So you get to choose who you will rescue. So someone asks you, who are you going to rescue? Versus who are you going to rescue? That's fine. What about now we look at our, our Disney prince over here and he says, hey, I'm going to the witch's lair to rescue her. This is fine. This is the full form going to versus I'm gonna the witch's lair to rescue her. What? That doesn't even make sense. Gonna what? You're gonna what? It, just you cannot contract there, right? And you may with a bit of introspection be able to try to verbalize what's going on that prevents going to from becoming gonna in this scenario, but that's the point. It's like you have an immediate sense that this is not okay, and then it's only later if you sit back and try to introspect about what that rule is that you might be able to come up with something, right? So your knowledge of language is this instantaneous, deployable thing, but it's based on these hidden rules that you've internalized, right? So. This and is really what babies are doing. Babies are awesome at language, just to recap. They're learning all of this stuff, right? In fact, they're learning all kinds of things about their native languages, about how to accomplish all kinds of things, which again, you as a native speaker of your languages have learned how to do for your, whatever languages you speak natively, right? You learn a ton, you have learned a ton, and a lot of what you learn, a lot of what babies learn is very subtle knowledge, a lot of these hidden rules that are hard to verbalize, and yet immediately can characterize things as being acceptable, which is not in their language, right? And they learn it all relatively fast. Again, you get a lot of this linguistic knowledge by the time you're four, you figured a lot of it out, right? Which is really quite amazing. So in short, go, go babies when it comes to learning language. They are uh, so thank you. <laughs> Again, my name is Lisa Pearl. I'm a professor of language science and of cognitive sciences at UC Irvine. I run the Computation of Language Laboratory, and I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation.